And Dar of Yay say, wherever I leave the house, and on whatever thing my eyes fall on, Sabr. Allah Ta'ala say, Wallahu yuhibbu al-sabirin. Allah Ta'ala asleep for that in Kina. School governing body of South Coast Madrasa. Absaruha Fatima. Wasallimu taslima hatta tanalu jannatan wa na'ima. Sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima hatta tanalu. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Faseha, for the warm introduction, and thank you to everybody who's gone into uh, putting together this, uh, this event. Uh, it's always a delight to come to South Africa. I feel like I'm at home when I'm here because of the solidarity and kinship and support uh, that I feel whenever I come to South Africa. This is actually my fourth visit, and each time it's a delight, and each time I learn something uh, new about the country. Um, I also want to thank you for coming here today during this lunch hour. I know it's uh, in between classes and during a time of exams. And I particularly want to thank you because I know what it was like to be a student having to do exactly what you're doing now, which is sit through a lecture, trying to educate yourselves at a time of, uh, of, the, um, of, of exams, etc. Yeah, lift it up? Okay. Is that better? Okay. My own history was, uh, as I mentioned, I was, I was born and raised in Canada and grew up in a household where we did not talk about Palestine. Uh, my mother always used to say, don't talk about politics and don't talk about religion and you will have plenty of friends. And sure enough, I didn't talk about politics, I didn't talk about religion, and I had plenty of friends. And all of this uh, kind of came to a head in the year 2000 when I was a fellow at the uh, Stanford Center for Conflict and uh, Conflict Resolution Negotiation, at the time was the, the period of the now quite famous Camp David negotiations between Israel and uh, the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization. Uh, and during that year that I was at California at Stanford, I had a friend who was an Israeli. And the two of us were very close friends, and I listened to my mother's advice, and I didn't talk about religion, and I didn't talk about politics, and we became very close friends. Uh, we talked about uh, music, theater, all the things that people in California talk about, which isn't very much. Uh, until one day, we were both sitting on campus and watching the television, and it was a press conference with uh, the, at the time, President Clinton, and uh, the, at the time, the Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak. And this came on the tail end of the negotiations. And President Clinton came out and he started talking about uh, Ehud Barak, who incidentally has a war criminal history. He's not somebody who is devoid of, of a military background. And he said, you know, this is a man of peace, I'm paraphrasing. And this is a man who went to great lengths uh, to try to achieve peace. And they later dubbed this the most generous offer. And what was interesting was my friend, who was Israeli, turned to me. And after a year of not speaking about politics or, or religion, uh, turned to me and said, you know, what is wrong with you people? Exactly, that was my reaction to it. I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, what's wrong with the Palestinians? I said, what do you mean, what's wrong with the Palestinians? That's quite a bold statement. And he said, aren't you listening to the news? Just look at what uh, President Clinton just said. And I said, I don't understand what you're talking about. And he said, you know, the generous offer. And I said, wait a sec, whoa, 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 let's hold back a second. What are you talking about? Let's go into the details. And I said, I don't understand, like, what is it that um, was going to happen to the Israeli settlements? 
Are they going to go? Are they going to stay? What exactly is going to happen? And my friend said, I, I don't know. And I said, well, what about um, the issue of Jerusalem? Are Palestinians finally going to be able to claim Jerusalem as their capital, visit their holy sites, have this as their city? As is mandated, by the way, under international law for both of them. He said, I don't know. And I said, well, what about the refugees? Are they finally going to be able to return to their homes after so many years of dispossession and the inability to return to their homes for one reason and one reason only, and that's because they're not Jewish? Is that finally going to be able to happen? And again, he said, I don't know. And I said, well, what do you know then? And he said, all that I know is that you've given up the best offer that is ever going to come your way. When, since when was it that this is Israeli land to be negotiated with and to be offered up to the Palestinians? And again, you know, he, he kept saying, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And I, I realized to myself that if he didn't know, um, this being my friend who we, I'd spent a year with, then I thought, and he, a quite well-educated person, by the way, I don't mean to disparage him in any way, um, then it was clear to me that a lot of people didn't know. And that there was a lot of energy spent on trying to deceive people, to turn this into a situation where people such as my friend, very well-educated and well-intentioned, did not know what was actually happening during the negotiations process. And it was with that comment, actually, that I decided to leave uh, California and the nice comforts of California uh, to move to Palestine. And I arrived on Palestine um, the, the first day of the second intifada, the second uprising. Uh, many people teased me that I brought it. I didn't, I assure you, it wasn't me, it just happened. Um, and so with that, that is, um, that is where my journey began. And so what I want to spend the rest of my talk to you uh, today is to just really try to highlight to you what happened during the Israeli-Palestinian peace process, how that peace process has turned into a lot of process and no peace and has actually failed the Palestinians. And I want to uh, end with uh, ways of, that we can move forward. Okay? Now, you know, when the peace process first began, uh, that very famous handshake that many of you may not remember, because I'm not sure if many of you were even alive at that time, but if you look back in history on September 13th, you can Google it, 1993, you'll see a very famous handshake between uh, the, the uh, late President, PLO chairman uh, Yasser Arafat and the Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. And uh, this famous handshake is what launched the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. And what was promised to Palestinians through this peace process was that within five-year period, a short five-year period, Palestinians would be free. It was going to be a little bit of a painful five-year period, but at the end of, of this five-year period, Palestinians would finally have their freedom and, uh, and, and be living in, living in a state of their own. But what ended up happening was exactly the opposite. The first thing that happened was that in order to be able to create what you now hear as the Palestinian Authority, the land of Palestine had to be divided up into various areas. Area A, which is the smallest area of the West Bank, it's about 17% of the West Bank, Area B, a little bit bigger, that comes under partial Palestinian control. Area A, by the way, is under exclusive Palestinian control. And Area C, the largest area, comes under Israeli control. And so the first thing that was done was to carve up Palestine into very small areas, into cantons, for lack of a better word, uh, where Palestinians now were blocked from moving freely within their country because of the presence of Israeli checkpoints. And you're going to see all of this come up on the map very shortly. But that was the very first thing that happened, was that Palestine was no longer one major unit, one territorial unit. 
it was now divided up into very small little cantons. And I don't think you could see very well. I'm going to try to turn the lights off here. Excuse me. Um, does that look better? Can you see the orange spaces there on this, on this screen here? These orange spaces on the screen were the areas that I was talking about that now came with, within partial Palestinian control. And you can see they're like little islands, okay, divided up between these various areas. So Palestine was no longer one territorial unit. It was now suddenly divided into these little cantons. So a little canton here, a little canton there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the reason that it was so divided was because what Israel sought to do and continues to seek to do is that it doesn't see Palestinians as equals. It doesn't want to give Palestinians equality, whether it's equality of state or equality of citizenship. They view Palestinians as what is called a demographic threat. And so they wanted to rid themselves, and still want to, rid themselves of as many Palestinians as possible on as little Palestinian land as possible. And so what they did in 1948, because that was what the Nakba was, was the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, got rid of 1.5 million Palestinians and took the land of Palestine. And then with the negotiations process, managed to ensure that all of these Palestinians are living in these tiny little places and surrounded by, what I'm going to show you next, areas that come under uh, Israeli control, meaning the settlements. So, see those purple areas that you see come up? Those are the settlements. So you can see that now Palestinian land, this process of getting rid of Palestinians and taking as much land as possible, the process is continuing first through 1948, and now through this peace process. Now what's interesting is the peace process, rather than bringing us peace, it ended up bringing us more and more of these Israeli settlements. Between the period of 1993, when the peace process first began, to the current day of 2014, the population of settlers, now all of the, the settlements are illegal. South Africa views them as illegal. Even the United States views them as illegal. Every country around the world views them as illegal, these purple dots. The settler population went from 200,000 settlers to now 600,000 settlers living illegally in the land of Palestine. It was as though the peace process gave Israel the green light to go ahead and build and expand more and more Israeli settlements. But it didn't just stop there. The next process was to try to take more land by declaring what was left of the West Bank into closed military areas. Okay. And you see that in the red space. So you can see how increasingly the land is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. Then they started a new tactic, which is to declare areas nature reserves. And you can see the nature reserves coming up as well. Do you see how the land is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller? In other words, get rid of the people, hold on to the land. And then, of course, the last step, which was something that I was involved with uh, challenging, and that is this wall that has gone up. Okay? You can see how, where the wall is and how all of this in some total has had the effect of dividing Palestinians into tiny little places. You see how small the land is getting? Smaller, 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 with as many Palestinians as possible on it. <laughs> صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما حتى تنالوا جنة ونعيما صلوا عليه In addition to the settlements that were built during the period of, uh, from 1993 to the year 2000, as a result of the peace process, 
the international community ended up funding something that they called peace roads. Now, these peace roads are very interesting. These are the roads that you see that have come up. These are called bypass roads because they quite literally bypass Palestinian areas and connect Israeli settlements to one another and connect those settlements into Israel. Okay? So again, the process, confine Palestinians into as little space as possible, as many into as little space and take as much land as possible. And you can see what the effect of this has been when you add on the Israeli checkpoints and closures and the final effect. So this is the situation that we live under today, which is that Palestinians are divided into these tiny little cantons, all smaller, 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 and smaller. And this was the impact of the peace process. Now, many people say to me, but you know, this can all be undone if you simply go and you start negotiating with the Israelis that negotiations are actually going to lead to an undoing of this situation, of this fragmentation. And what I want to tell you is it's actually quite the opposite, that it's negotiations that has led to this situation, not the other way around, not the lack of negotiations. And I want to get to what uh, my friend Ido, my, who my Israeli friend at the time in, uh, in California, had said to me when I had asked him, what was going to happen to the settlements? What was going to happen to Jerusalem? What was going to happen to the refugees? And I'm going to just give you a flavor of what actually happened during those negotiations and show you how failed a peace process this actually was. During the negotiations themselves, what the Israelis refused to do is they refused to recognize that Palestinians are equals. And they refuse to recognize that Palestinians are, have rights under international law. And so instead, the negotiations process ended up being a situation in which we were negotiating, we, a very weak party, living under the system and living under Israeli military rule, were negotiating with a very powerful party. But not just a powerful party, with a party that quite literally could close down entire cities at, when it, just by, by order, by a military order. Okay. And so what ended up happening in the negotiations, and I'll give you a flavor, was that I recall very distinctly during one negotiation session when the Israeli negotiators were demanding that we give up this portion of land. Now this portion, by the way, is 22 kilometers into the West Bank. The West Bank is tiny, by the way. It's a really small, small, small piece of land, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, how small it is. And I asked the Israeli negotiator, I said, well, on what basis of international law are you demanding that we give up more land? And he chuckled. And he turned to me and he said, I will recognize international law when I am forced to recognize international law. And until that time, it's just you and me in a room. And so this is precisely the flavor of negotiations and the peace process. It is just me and the negotiator in the room, and whatever he says goes because he has the power and I do not. So whether it was the settlements and the Israelis demanding that these, that these illegal settlements remain permanently on Palestinian land, that was one thing they demanded. Or whether it was that they continue to maintain this presence here, this entire entirety of land here. You can see the, this is the border, by the way, with Jordan. There's nothing that borders Jordan that's Palestinian because the Israelis have taken it. The Israelis continue to demand that they hold on to the land between the border of the West Bank and Jordan. So the settlements, they want to remain. The border, they want to hold on to. The water beneath the land, we are, we're a water-scarce area, they wanted to control to continue to control, as they do today. The airspace above, which is not only just to fly an airplane, but the electromagnetic spectrum, your cell phones, all of the things that we use today, the Israelis demanded to continue to control. When it came to Jerusalem, they similarly demanded to have permanent control over Palestinian religious sites as well, with, uh, the, with different arrangements for Palestinians to be able to pray at their holy sites. When it came to refugees, 
including my family, who was ethnically cleansed from their homes in 1948. The Israelis made it very clear there would be no return. So in other words, all of the issues under international law, all the specifications under international law, the Israelis refused to abide by because, going back to what the negotiator said, it was just me and him in the room. And I just want to very quickly um, take you through just one little slide, just so you can see where we are today. Turn that off. This is a map of uh, your beautiful country. Do you see this little red dot here? Do you see that? Does anybody know what that is? You get a cookie if you do. Huh? <laughs> okay. Or biscuit, as you would say. Yes. That's the size of Gaza, actually. Very close. You get half a cookie. <laughs> it's the size of Gaza. Now, in this tiny little spot of uh, Gaza, over the course of this summer, over 50 days this summer, there were more than 20,000 tons of bombs dropped in this tiny little area, just so you can see it. Now I'm going to show you what it looks like compared to Johannesburg. This tiny little area, 20,000 tons of bombs dropped in this tiny little area. I hope none of your houses are in this area. Okay. Uh, you live there? In this tiny, <laughs> there's a oh my hotel's there. Oh, I'm sorry, I should have moved it over. <laughs> uh, in this tiny little area, twenty thousand homes were demolished. In this tiny, tiny, tiny little area, two thousand one hundred and twenty-seven Palestinians were killed, seventy percent of whom were civilians. In this tiny little area, five hundred and twenty-one children were killed as a result of Israeli bombs. But the bombs didn't just target Palestinians or Palestinian homes. They actually went in and systematically, and I say systematically, targeted Palestinian civilian infrastructure. Uh, everything from hospitals. There were 69 hospitals and medical facilities that were hit by Israeli bombs. Mosques that were targeted by Israeli bombs. Over 100 schools that were targeted by Israeli bombs. Now, listen, by the way, the only other place that has ever targeted, that has ever hit schools, targeted schools, is the Taliban, just so you can understand the, what we're dealing with here. All the, the Gaza Strip's only power plant was hit by Israeli bombs. All of this as a means of systematically trying to target the Palestinian civilian infrastructure. And herein lies the problem, that this would not have been able to happen in this tiny little area where, as I said, I hope none of you live, were it not for the fact that we've been engaged now for 21 years in a process of negotiations, rather than in a process of holding Israel accountable. And by, what I mean by accountable, it, is, it doesn't make sense to me that although Israel continues to violate international law by building and expanding Israeli settlements, just as it did with, during the meeting uh, that the Israeli Prime Minister had with Barack Obama the other day, as they were meeting, the Israeli government announced the expansion of yet another 2,610 housing units. All of this is Israel's impunity, dropping bombs, building settlements, demolishing homes, taking land. All of this flies in the face of not only international law, but human rights law. And this is where I think you as students are now coming in, and where I come in and everybody else comes in. The process of engaging in negotiations was actually a very disempowering process. It didn't give you or me the ability to do anything, because, as I said, we were stuck in a room with somebody who had the power to rule over and do whatever it is that was demanded. But by moving and empowering you, and by pushing for boycotts, pushing for sanctions, pushing for divestment, pushing for Israel's exclusion, pushing for accountability, you and me now get to have more of a say in ensuring that freedom comes for Palestinians. 
This is not an issue that is as complicated as the Israelis make it out to be. There's two issues, that's it, liberation and return. And both of those things can be achieved, but in order to achieve them, we have to begin the process of holding Israel accountable. We cannot live in another situation where this tiny little area is once again subjected to 20,000 tons of bombs. That this tiny little area is once again subjected to over 100 schools bombed. This tiny little area is subjected once again to over 69 medical facilities bombed, all in violation of international law. And so what I want to leave you with is I want to encourage you to get more involved in the boycott movement, in the divestment movement, in pushing for sanctions, pushing for exclusion, and pushing for accountability. And it starts on university campuses like yours. It starts on university campuses like yours. We in Palestine look to South Africa on so many levels. And I'm hoping that you will also look to us and lend us your hand. And thank you. وسلموا تسليما حتى تنالوا جنة ونعيما صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما حتى تنالوا جنة ونعيما صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما حتى تنالوا جنة ونعيما صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما حتى تنالوا جنة ونعيما صلوا عليه